Hello. 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 How are you doing? They must know it's very hot in here because they've lined up waters. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I'm sorry. It's going to get very small and very hot pretty quickly, but um, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you so much for coming and um, uh, very happy to be in Denmark for the first time. Uh, and very happy to have made it because it was like crazy with this SAS strike trying to get it. I thought it was going to be coming in by boat at one point. <laughs> um, anyway, so our topic today is uh, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, Turning Local Music into Global Success. Um, and uh, I think anyone who spends much time coaching or consulting or trying to help people move their careers or their lives from point A to point B, which is a lot of what music publishers do every day, um, quickly see that the first step in helping someone set a strategy uh, for their career or their life is helping them to visualize that the goal, what they're aiming for, is actually attainable um, realistically. And the success of someone else, especially someone from a similar region or a similar background, uh, can sometimes be the catalyst that helps you start to see that what you've always thought of is actually within your grasp. In that sense, there's never been a better time to turn local music into your music, into global success. <coughs> Popular music has probably never been more international than it is right now. Um, there are Scandinavian producers and songwriters and artists having success all over the world, from America to Asia. Uh, there are African superstars topping the UK charts. There are Korean pop hits going viral in the United States. There are uh, Italian or there are American artists breaking out of Italy. There are Dutch DJs touring the world. There are Danish artists being nominated for Grammys. Um, I recently signed two young German trap producers and uh, within just a couple weeks of having signed the deal, um, they had two songs on two different top ten albums in the US, both with American hip-hop artists. Um, if there's a predominant characteristic, I think, among songwriters uh, today, it's that they all work entirely without borders. They attend writing camps all over the world. They work with and collaborate with and are inspired by and borrow from and compete with writers from all over the world. The advantage, of course, that you have is that you're Danish and you are Scandinavian. And so you've had a chance to see this global success story play out much more often than most people in Europe. Um, probably no one here needs to be convinced that it's possible. Uh, the question is just how. And that's why you're all here, and that's why you're all staring at me, hoping I can provide an answer. Um, and as is usually the case, the answer is already here. It's, uh, it's, the answers are sitting right next to you. Um, a room full of successful publishers and songwriters and record label owners and artists and writers, and, and they're all right here around you. Um, all you have to do is study the people who are going to be on the panel that I'm moderating just after, after this um, and learn from those people, be inspired by them. Um, what I can provide is the perspective maybe of someone who's had the opportunity to work with, sometimes closely, sometimes from a distance, people who've made that transition from local to global artists like David Guetta uh, or The Script, producers like Max Martin and Andreas Carlson and Stargate, and songwriters like Fred Rister and Ruth Ann Cunningham, Wayne Hector and Steve Robson. Um, all of these people have taken their music from wherever it was that they started in the world and become international, uh, international figures. Given our time frame today, I want to try to share with you four observations about the challenge of internationalizing your business. Some are exhortations, do this, do that, that kind of thing. Uh, the last one is kind of a warning, a caution sign in the middle of the road. But the first one is really a matter of defining. It's understanding clearly what we're talking about when we 
talk about the idea of global success. So here's point number one. Global success is not the same as worldwide success, and it's not the same as U.S. success. One of my greatest frustrations with the American music market is how myopic it can frequently be. It's very turned in on itself, completely focused in on what's happening within its own market and not very interested in what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, even now, when there are international producers and artists and songwriters taking, taking up a huge portion of the Hot 100 on any given week, you can still find many, many, I would say a majority of A&R people who are entirely focused on the U.S. market and, and really not very interested in what's happening outside of it. Um, unfortunately, that idea that puts America at the center and ignores everything around it has become sometimes an export product for us and we send it overseas and it starts to infiltrate the thinking of other people who are not American. Um, I've met so many artists and publishers as well who have put so much time and money into trying to break the U.S. market. It becomes an obsession trying to crack the U.S. market at the expense of everything else. They'll try to change their style completely. They'll, they'll ignore their own local market. They'll try to waste money on things like hiring big name U.S. <coughs> producers or going and recording the whole album in Los Angeles, all with the hope of having a hit in the U.S. Have you guys seen the numbers on artists and streaming for India, they dwarf the United States, dwarf them. It's massive, the YouTube numbers on artists in India. Africa's music market is exploding at the moment. Mm -hmm. Places like the Middle East, uh, they're starting to open up. China remains challenging, but they're developing their own entertainment sector as well. Colombia has emerged as a major market for Latin music in South America. A global approach to the music business means that we need to think globally, not focus on one foreign market at the expense of everything else. The point is that you, you don't need to have worldwide success. There are actually very few, when you really think about it, there are very few people who have what could legitimately be called worldwide success, when you include in Japan and India and Russia and China and the Middle East. The point is not to find success everywhere. The point is to find success anywhere you can. Again, I'm telling you something that most of you already know, um, because in fact, Scandinavians were pretty much the first people into the J-pop market and then the K-pop market. And a lot of people in this room have had great success there. Um, in fact, a lot of publishers in Scandinavia had success in Asia with a sort of pure pop, very traditional Scandinavian type of sound that would not have worked in the US at that, at that particular moment. This is the point of globalization. Find where people respond to what you do. It doesn't actually matter where it is. Whatever you do, if it's good, there's probably a market somewhere outside of your own territory where you can exploit it but you can't be sentimental about it. The fact that this is a place where all your favorite bands came from, or this is a place where there's an arena that you always dreamed of playing, or you saw this place in the movies, it, none of that matters. Even if it's the biggest or most lucrative market, that's not important. So long as there's an opportunity and the country has a valid currency to pay you in, it's a valid market. <laughs> Once you find a foreign market in which you think you can do business, the next question becomes how do you approach it? Which brings me to the second point. Don't sell ice to Eskimos. This is point number two. Do not sell ice to Eskimos. One thing I saw very clearly in working with both Stargate and David Guetta is that you do not break into another market simply by imitating what's already there. Nor do you necessarily do it by doing exactly what you did in the market that is your home country. 
You do it by bringing your own unique influences to the music that's already in that territory. I think that's true of the immigration experience in general. I come to your country, I bring new ideas, I bring different, I different influences, different perspectives, but I don't come with the idea that we're going to do everything in exactly the same way as I did it at home. I remember Stargate being very clear about this when they made their first trip to the US. Um, I was working at Sony and we had booked them in at Sony Studios. They were going to do a month in New York of co-writing and collaboration. And we were working to pull in as many American top liners as we could to work with them. And Mikel and Tor knew that they wanted to move their music into a more American urban type of, type of style. They didn't want to just do the same sort of light pop R&B that they'd already had a lot of success with in the UK. At the same time, at that particular point in time in the US, the market was very insular. Uh, most of the urban music was coming out of Atlanta at that moment, and they weren't necessarily looking for two tall, gangly, blonde Norwegian guys to help them out with it. Um, also, the music itself was very static at that time. It was very, it was all rhythm. It was very little melody, not a lot of chord changes. It was very flat and, and all based on rhythm. And I remember having the discussion with Mikel and Tor, and they really knew almost instinctively that their contribution was going to be bringing some of that Scandinavian melodic sensibility and sense of chord progression back into the music. And it's that element that caught the ear of Neo, who was at the, who was at the Stony Studios at that time working on another project, and obviously he and Stargate came together and wrote So Sick and, and that's kind of, everything flowed from there. But it worked because they didn't try to copy. They integrated their sound with the music that was already there. About 10 years later, David Guetta did something very similar. There's no question that what allowed him to break through in the US and sort of open the door for the whole EDM movement in that country was his decision to bring his very European, sort of French-Dutch influenced dance music production sensibility and DJ mentality and combine it with American urban artists like Kelly Rowland and Flo Rider and probably most importantly Will I Am. This has been the Scandinavian formula over and over from Cutfather to Soul Shock and Carlin to Max Martin to Avicii to Lucas. Uh, Graham and, and many others. Uh, as much as it's influenced by international styles, it doesn't copy them wholesale. It brings a new sensibility and grafts it on top of what's already there. Larger countries like Germany and France, with the possible exception of David Guetta and, and probably Daft Punk, have not actually done this as well. If the only way your style can work in a particular market is for you to abandon it entirely and try to imitate what's already successful there, you're probably in the wrong market. So go back to step one and find a different place in the world that allows you to integrate your own musical influences. And then once you find it, go there. That's point number three. Go there. Woody Allen said that 80% of success is showing up. <laughs> when you look at the people on the next panel, the difference between them and people who have not been able to build an international component to their business is largely simply a willingness to get on an airplane and go. To go wherever they think there might be an opportunity for them or their writers or their music. It's really that simple. They go to conferences like this. They go to writing camps. They go to LA for a week or a month and they sit in the office of strangers. And I'm sure on those first meetings, often the strangers had no idea why someone from Norway or Denmark was sitting in their office. And they didn't know anyone outside of their territory until they went out and met them. They had absolutely no guarantees that their international strategy would work or that their music was ready for a larger market. In fact, 
probably on that first trip, their music wasn't ready for the larger market. And they only figure that out by sitting in that stranger's office and playing it. And that's what allowed them to come back, fix it, get it ready, and then build from there. The act of going was the only strategy that really mattered. I know that sounds simplistic, um, especially from someone who gets to charge their travel back to a company. Um, there are costs to be considered, obviously. Uh, there's also timing. You need to go when you have a project that, that needs you to go, um, that's ready to present to the world and that has relevance to the, to the outside world. Um, obviously, I know there are family obligations and day jobs and other issues. But realistically, I, I've had a travel, a travel week from hell, but my original booking uh, to, come, to come here was from another country in Europe and it was on EasyJet, and I think it probably cost me 75 euro or something like that. How much does it really cost for you to go to an international conference? Um, full of people from all over the world, like this one, like ADE, like Reaper Bond or IMS or even Meta. If you can't pay for the registration, then just work the hotel lobby. If, if you can't stay for three days, then hit it hard for one. Some of you guys may know, I'm sure some of the other publishers do, some of you may know uh, Stephen Gringer, who's an A&R on the publishing side over at Pulse in Los Angeles. Um, I've known Stephen uh, forever, seemingly. He interned for me at Shapiro Bernstein while he was still at Berkeley College of Music and then worked for us for a year before he moved out to LA. But shortly after he took on his A&R role at Pulse, they pulled him in and they said, listen, we really want you to focus your energies on the international side. And in particular, helping us establish a presence in the Latin music market, which was really starting to blow up at the time. <coughs> Uh, Stephen knew nothing, really, about Latin music in particular. He had no contacts in Mexico or Puerto Rico. Uh, I don't even really think he spoke all that much Spanish. But Stephen, being the maniacally driven person that he is, immediately signed up for Spanish lessons. On top of the Japanese lessons he was already taking because Fuji had purchased a, a share of uh, Pulse, he flew to Puerto Rico and to... Mexico, he went to the bomb conference in Bogota, he went to the Latin and Music Awards, he went to the, the, the Latin Grammys and the Latin, and, and the Latin Songwriters Hall of Fame, and he learned every single writer and producer and artist within all of the Latin genres, including all the, the Mexican regional styles. Um, he signed young artists and started developing them. Within two years, all those Latin connections came together, and they wound up with a piece of uh, Despacito, the massive Luis, Luis Fonsi hit. For better or worse, building an international presence for your building, for, for your business, is not rocket science. It's just work. It's just making the investment in everything from <coughs> flights to language lessons in the hope of finding success wherever you can. But if you want to get there, you have to buy the ticket. That's my exhortation for you. Now here's the word of caution that I promised at the end. I say this because in my experience, what I'm about to tell you is the single biggest stumbling block for Europeans, Scandinavians included, um, in trying to break into the US market in particular. It often leads very talented people to waste a lot of time before they finally start to figure it out. So I'm gonna throw it out there with the hopes that maybe I'll save you some time and money as you start to reach out to people in the U.S. market. While you want to bring your influences, as I said, you want to bring your influences and incorporate them into the music that's already there. You have to remember that when it comes to a country as diverse as the U.S., where you literally have every different possible race, religion, income bracket, gender, background, all living together in what is often a less than idyllic coexistence. You have to understand how music functions in that culture. 
as I said, this seems to be a particular puzzle for Europeans. I think because Europeans generally absorb the different styles of American music as being all of one big pop culture. Is there a word in, in Danish for stew? Like a stew, like your mom makes, like meat. What? Gulat. Gulat. Thank you. We say goulash, but that's my, my grandma used to make goulash. But you, the correct one is gulat. Okay. Um, I think to many people outside of the U.S., uh, American pop culture feels like one big gulat, one big, one big stew, carrots and meat and noodles and rice and onions and everything all thrown in together to make up one thing, which is pop music. But that's not really how these musics function within the United States. In America, each of these things, alt rock, classic rock, hip hop, classic R&B, EDM, jazz, the various styles of Latin, all of these are their own separate culture. For the people who are the core audience for those genres, this music is not just one ingredient in the whole stew. For the core audience, this music is the identifying element in their life. It reflects who they are culturally and racially and regionally and, and, and economically and spiritually. It is their identity. That's why in the US there are a million different radio stations. There's an alt rock radio and there's hip hop and there's R&B and there's classic R&B and there's country and there's classic country and there's jazz and there's smooth jazz and all of these playlists on all of these stations are completely entirely exclusive. They don't mix in a classic rock record in the middle of a hip hop radio station. Because for the core audience, not the of the moment pop listener, but the core audience that drives those genres, those two styles, classic rock and hip hop, are mutually exclusive. They're not part of the stew. Each one is the main course. So what does this mean to you, coming from outside of the country, who may not have all this emotional and, and, uh, and philosophical baggage attached to what is in fact just music? It just means that an American audience for a particular genre may accept you bringing some of your influences to what they perceive as their music. But if you change their music in a way that isn't consistent with their culture, or maybe even which they feel diminishes their culture, or you try to do it, you try to create the music without understanding the culture, or without involving anyone who's actually in the culture, or if you try to combine different elements from different cultures that might not be compatible, like a chef making a very bad stew, you will be rejected. And it will usually be by the marketing and promotion department and will happen about three weeks before the record's scheduled to come out. The A&R people will think you're a genius. Oh, how he brings all these different elements and she mixes this style and that style. And isn't it great? Yes, it's great. Until the marketing and promotion people hear it and they immediately listen to it and go, I have no idea who the audience for this record is or where we'll take it. And that record will not come out. When I was at Sony ATV, we worked with a producer writer who'd been very successful in Germany and had moved to the US. I'm not gonna use his name because it's not really important. There are at least two or three other people I could have used as an example, all about the same thing. Very hardworking guy, always had like two or three acts in development at various labels, and he was writing and producing for all of them. So from a publishing standpoint, it looked quite good. But every time I would visit his studio, he would brief me on the various acts that he was working on. And he would explain to me that this act, he was taking some rock and he was mixing it with hip hop and it even had a little bit of country. This other act had a female pop singer fronting it, but there was a dance hall guy involved and the chord changes were all very jazzy. He was making stews. And I tried to explain to him that he hadn't thought through sufficiently the cultural implications of what he was doing by combining all these things. But he really couldn't understand it. 
To him, it was all just American music. And for three years, every single act that he had signed to a label would get dropped three weeks before the record was supposed to come out, as soon as the finished record had been sent to promotion and marketing. Fortunately, the story has a very happy ending. Because he was a very, very talented guy and very hardworking, he eventually began to work with established artists within that world. And as he did that, they began to show him and teach him what could and couldn't be accepted within a particular genre. He was then in the business of adding his influences into styles that already existed. And he began to have a huge success, which he completely deserved. But he spent five or six years getting there when he could have spent two. I'm trying to help save you those four years. So here's the takeaway when you're working on music outside of your own culture. If you're going to work in someone else's culture, you should probably start by making sure that you're working with someone from inside that culture. When Steve Robson wanted to break into the country music world, he did it by going down to Nashville and working with Jeffrey Steele. He didn't try to do it from London with Wayne Hector, as talented as Wayne Hector is. All music, in a certain sense, is local, and so you have to work with the locals. Don't fool yourself that just because you speak English very well, or because you know every record in a particular genre, or because you have all the sounds in your library that's on this current hit record, that somehow you understand the culture. That takes a lifetime. I'm learning to speak Italian, and on some days I'm okay, but it doesn't make me Italian. Appreciate that the style and every genre of music comes from a particular group of people and a particular culture, and handle it with care. Don't treat musical elements like ingredients in a stew. Think of them more like chemicals. And if you mix them together in the test tube in the wrong way, they're going to blow up in your face. So we've talked about a few ways to help take your music from a local phenomenon to a global impact. The importance of being open to any territory, wherever it may be. The idea of avoiding selling ice to Eskimos, but rather integrating your style into music that already exists in the territory. And the all-important first step of getting on the plane and going there. And once you're there, the importance of understanding how music fits into the culture of wherever it is that you are. So what happens if, if you succeed? Um, it really depends on your own goals. But I will tell you that Shapiro Bernstein, where I work, uh, which is a small, independent, very old New York-based publisher, uh, the international approach we've taken has really transformed our business and made all the difference in, in increasing the presence of our company. One of the first records we picked up when I got there was Corinne Bailey Ray's Put Your Records On out of the UK. Shortly thereafter, we signed a, a girl from Dublin, um, Ruth Ann Cunningham, who went on to have uh, a lot of hits with, she wrote Too Little Too Late for JoJo and Pixie Lot when she was with us. Uh, did some work with uh, Cutfather, quite a bit of stuff with Cutfather actually in Denmark. And, um, and then went on to huge success after that. All of that led us to a French DJ named David Guetta. Uh, which obviously worked out very well for us. In the meantime, we've signed uh, an African songwriter uh, based in Norway who was part of Nico and Vince's Am I Wrong, a heavy metal catalog out of France, and the two young German trap producers who I just mentioned, um, just as an example. But the global approach allows us to compete in a way that we probably could not if we were just confined to competing in a market that's as, ex as expensive and as competitive as the US. That's all great, but on a more personal note, I wanted to say that beyond the growth opportunities for the business, um, one of the most rewarding aspects for me, taking a global approach to music publishing has been the opportunity for personal growth, to meet people and interact with them from literally all over the world. And to come to a conference like this one, to see Denmark for the first time, to catch up with a lot of old friends, we're gonna be on up here in just a second, as well as to meet new friends and, uh, and hear about what is happening in a different place. That's an opportunity for which I'm so grateful. 
Um, I've been in this game a very long time, and long enough to realize that no one actually rules the world, uh, at least not for very long. Um, what keeps this business fresh and compelling and engaging for me is the chance to come to places like this, to meet people from all over the world and talk about music and business and life and see if there is something that we can do together. So I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank the SPOT conference for having me. And uh, I hope you guys will stick around for the panel that we're going to do here right now. Uh, these are some of my most admired music publishers in the world, uh, some of these Scandinavian publishers. So I'm really looking forward to this. And I look forward to meeting all of you guys and hearing some new music and seeing some new artists and seeing if there's a way we can all do business together in Denmark. Thank you. No, I haven't. It's open. It's open seating. First come, first serve, guys. I thought we'd negotiate the seating. Actually, that should only take us about an hour. It's an equal split. It's an equal split. Yeah. Good to see you, man. How you been? <laughs> Where would you like me in all this? Um, you want me over here, maybe? Am I going to feed back if I'm too? I, I, maybe we're going to work each other side. Okay, I think that's better. You got it. <laughs> I'll take my table with me. We go in the other direction. <laughs> Did you guys get the, the memo that we're supposed to turn off our mics when we're not speaking? Yep. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if that's just to keep you from actually going public when you're slagging what somebody's saying or if it's actually because of the sound system. But. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, this is a real pleasure. As I said, um, this is a group that uh, I think I've known almost everyone on here for quite, quite a few years and some of the most respected publishers in the music industry without question, but certainly some of the people that I admire the most and have learned the most from. So it's, it's a real honor to be able to moderate this panel. Um, since we're not doing intros, I think maybe what I'll do is just have everybody do a quick, very quick uh, explanation of who you are, what your company is, and, and kind of what you do, the basis of what you do, in case there are people in this room that aren't familiar with any of you, which seems remarkable to me, but it is possible, I suppose. <laughs> ben, do you want to shoot it off? Um, yeah, here we go. On and off. Should be the same in Danish, right? Come on, you were an artist. Hi. You know this kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, my name is Ben Malian, and I uh, I've been in the publishing side of the business since early nineties. I run uh, the Swedish uh, entity of a Danish company, actually called the Bank, and I'm also the kind of senior A and R dude for the whole group, uh, overlooking and making sure we have hits. And I know Eric exactly twenty years. <laughs> my name is Kai Ruberle. <coughs> I run a company called Waterfall Music. Originally, I was a music producer. Uh, started out in the mid '80s. Started Waterfall Music, the publishing company, in 1997. I've been developing artists and writers out of <laughs> Norway, Scandinavia, Nordics for 20-something years. Hi, I'm Søren from Tiger Spring. Uh, I co-founded the company about 10 years ago. So I'm a little bit younger than these guys, so if you can't tell. Oh, uh, you know, uh, guys like that always <laughs> have to say it, don't they? Um, <laughs> I've been, 
uh, I've been running the company from abroad for most of the years. So I was in uh, London for seven years, New York for a year, LA for a couple of years. So I definitely know the part about traveling. Um, back in Copenhagen now, uh, where we have a little office and it's developing writers, artists, trying to export that out of Scandinavia, basically. Yeah, my name is, uh, is this on? Right, yeah. uh, my name is Christian uh, Svenningsen. I oversee the publishing at GL Music, Copenhagen-based independent. Um, I joined the company right when the publishing got started, what, six, seven years ago? Eric was our yeah. first uh, US first sub -publisher. Sub publisher. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, Copenhagen based. I think we're the only one doing sub publishing out of this bunch. So we oversee. And you guys have built a big business. No, no you're not. Oh, that's right. <laughs> you're as well, sorry. Um, no, so we oversee 25 catalogs, Elvis, David Guetta, a um, bunch of that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, it's funny because Ben and I wound up taking the train in today and we were talking and we realized that in fact we do know each other for almost exactly 20 years because. Uh, we met, I think, on maybe my second or third day on the job, uh, right when I first started in publishing, and he was, I think, making his first trip to the U.S., um, and, uh, and he had a writing team then called Epicenter that I was very interested in signing, but uh, he was, I think, probably the first Scandinavian publisher I met and had the opportunity to work with, um, like I said, 20 years ago. And what, I'm, what I wanted to start off by talking about is, you know, it has been 20 years. It's amazing. The, the Scandinavian dominance of pop music has lasted 20 years now. Other styles have come and gone and come back again, and the Scandinavians are still there, uh, still being very successful in the pop music market. Um, but obviously, as you have that kind of success, the business situation starts to change to some degree. And I wanted to just ask you, um, now that it's been 20 years, do you guys find yourself frequently competing with, with ta for talent uh, with, on a global level with American companies, with companies from Germany, with people from other, from other territories entirely? Is most of the competition between each other? Um, or how are you, what, what, how has the sense of competition changed for local talent or has it? Um, ben, do you want to kick that off? I mean, it, it's changed a bit. Um, I mean, I, I think in Sweden we were kind of first in on the on the publishing side, and and we did exactly what you what you mentioned in your in your keynote speaking. Uh, myself and, and and a bunch of other guys, we we bought the ticket and we went. Uh, and you know, uh, he's right. Showing up is eighty percent of the success. <laughs> So, so, but it has changed, and you can see, you can now see UK companies, US companies, German companies, uh, and I'm talking out of a Swedish perspective now, moving into Sweden and, and trying to set up entities or, or trying to sign writers. Uh, but it's also, it's kind of, it's fine from a, uh, because we have so many talented writers in, in Sweden, mm -hmm. and I know I sound like the regular Swede now bragging, but it's actually, <laughs> it's actually the case. Uh, so, so that's all fine, and, and I try to comfort myself with the f kind of statistical fact that that most of Scandinavian success and, and, and Swedish success in particular has happened out of Sweden. There's very few people that has been originally signed in another territory and then you know ruled the world, if you like. Right. Uh, there's a lot of dead bodies in the deserts around LA, though. Just like <laughs> you, said, you know, people who, who had the dream but yeah. didn't do their homework. So yes, it's changed a bit, but not not, but not, dramatic, not, not, not dramatically now. Kai, what's your sense of, of Norway? Is that is has that changed? Uh, you mentioned that you know a lot of the majors are not as involved. Maybe um, what what's your have, have you been surprised at how it's changed, or has it has it affected your business as as the success has grown? Have you had to compete with your own success to some to some extent? <coughs> It's, it has changed. Uh, the majors actually used to be in Oslo uh, until 95, 96, around there. Then they pulled out, and I guess that's why I started World for Music in 1997. Right. <laughs> the year after they left. Uh, they left like a vacuum in Norway. Uh, for me, to find talent and develop talent has not really been a big competition because the majors have been quite absent. 
especially in the beginning after they left. The last uh, last 10 years or something, Sony TV, for instance, has been a bit more proactive in the Norwegian market. But uh, being an independent publisher with without like huge uh, resources, you, you, you have to find talent early, but you can also find talent early because you are in your own market. Right. So it's easier for me to see talent early than for Sony TV or Universal's people in Stockholm. Right. So very often we find talent at a very early stage and we do a lot of development. And uh, so from that perspective, it hasn't really changed that much. Uh, hmm. What about Copenhagen? Do you guys see a change? Soren, do you see a change coming back from London or LA? And yeah, I think so, for sure. I think, I mean, going back maybe 10 years ago, or even just five years ago, there, there weren't really a publishing scene in Denmark. I mean, there were a few people doing it, and like you said, like Cutfather and a couple of other right. people have been exporting music for quite a few years, but it, w it would always be Sweden in that sense that we would, we would go, we would try and pull down people from Stockholm, or all the artists would go to Stockholm to write, which is still, to a certain extent, the case if you're looking at like bigger American artists. They usually tend to fly to Stockholm instead of Oslo or Copenhagen when they come to Scandinavia. But, um, but I think it's changed a lot, and I think also the, the talent has changed. I, I think a little bit what you, what you tapped into early in terms of uh, the perception it was a very local, I think, spot as well, coming here earlier. I uh, <coughs> remember coming here with, with international colleagues, again, seeing it with the outside perspective. A lot of it, a lot of it was not, you, know, you weren't able to export it really. It, it would work for P3, and P3 was even more kind of local sounding early on. So I think that has changed. People are writing more, it's more adaptable to the international market, a little bit like the Swedes have been doing for quite a few years. Right. So I think in, in that sense it's changed, but, but we definitely see as well that people are signing writers earlier and earlier because the com competition is bigger, but I think it's a good thing overall for, for, for the whole industry. Christian, I'm curious, do you, and I'll open this up to the rest of you as well, are you surprised at all that there's not more presence mm -hmm. from US A&R and I mean, given the success rate of, of Scandinavian writers in, in the world, overall, you would think, I mean, my, let me put it this way, if, if all of a sudden a huge portion of, of the Danish charts were being taken up by Belgians, I think most of you guys would be buying a ticket to Belgium, going like, what the hell, I'm, I'm going to Belgium, I'm figuring this out, who can I sign? <laughs> Are you surprised that Americans, Germans, others haven't been haven't been doing that and coming and just outbid it, just just paying more, putting a guy on the ground if they have to here to, to suss stuff out and find it? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, obviously there's a huge talent pool, as as Ben was mentioning. There's a lot of talent that's still unsigned or, or there's not as much competition on, on each individual writer but um, going back to culture it's a hard it's hard markets to get into and a lot of the US, US ANRs are uh, major publishing ANRs so they have a local office that they trust who are Swedes or Danes or whatever um, but on the indie side um, I think it's seen as very small territories meaning even if we have a big international presence, uh, if you look at a Swedish writer in Sweden right, sure. or a Danish writer in Denmark, it doesn't compare to a German hip hop producer in Germany. Right. So in that sense, if you're a UK company or US company, you'll look at 80 million people in Germany or the UK as a market where we are still so small. I mean, we're what, 12, 20 million people, those right. three countries combined. So in that sense, we are, we are still kind of a, a younger brother. So. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It, until you factor in the potential for international success, which then obviously changes the game completely. But yeah, and uh, uh, what uh, Kai was saying, you know, we're into developing new talents. Right. And uh, we have ways to find them, yeah. or they have ways to find us. And and uh, an American publisher, a German publisher, normally gets interested when when it's too late. Yeah. Because they're already signed to a smaller or or you know. And the other thing is, and I think it's true of all you guys, uh, knowing your history, is that you're good at actually 
developing the talent. Uh, you know, literally in the studio, working with people, building <coughs> songwriters, which is not something that you can do. I mean, I, you know, that, that was my one trepidation even about signing these two German kids that I signed, is I don't actually like to do that because I haven't had great experience. You think, well, you know, we're in a global world now. I have the internet. I have all this stuff that we can communicate all the time. We can Skype every day. It's like, eh. You need to be there. You need to be on the ground and be able to hang out with people and talk to them to help develop them. Um, I, in that vein, how much of a... I know Ben and I talked about this earlier, and it's, the studio is a big part of what the bank does. Do all of you guys have studio complexes, and are those all part, like a, a, like a key element in your business plan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, I think, and it's uh, like I said to you on the train. I think it has a it has a big social value. It's not the room in itself. It's it's the it's the fact that in the digitalized world, I, I think there's a longing to, to hang out with people, be be around like minded and talk about sounds or chords or whatever. You know, probably not what they're talking about, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fully. They're talking, but they're complaining about their publisher actually. Exactly. Uh, but. Uh, but do you guys do you guys find that your writers are at the studios pretty consistently doing what Ben was just talking about, hanging out, working with each other, getting to know each other? Or is it a situation where most of the time they're at home working on their own laptop and then every now and then they show up and do a vocal session and leave? Um, what's, what's been your experience, of any of you? Okay, yeah. Hey. Um, yeah, but... Um I want to go back to your speech a little bit because you everything you said goes for how we have developed the company, traveling, being there. You know. uh, but you you talked a lot about how we work and develop producer writers. Mm -hmm. What we have done, uh, which was a stupid idea uh, from the first place, was to develop uh, top liners right. from Norway. Uh, so one thing you didn't mention that much is lyrics. Yes, yeah. I wanted to talk about this actually. Because the answer to your question, yes, or, or producer writers are in the studio uh, talking about sounds, uh, being social, and we, we, we generate a space for them to develop and we bring people in from the outside. And that's really important. But um, for them, it's to be able to get people from the outside in to work with them in Oslo. That used to be really hard 15 years ago to get people to come out from New York or LA or <coughs> Berlin or wherever to or come Sweden. to work or yeah. even Sweden <laughs> to come to Oslo. Today it's much easier to get people yeah. to Oslo. Mm. Uh, but the hardest part has been, and that's been our biggest success, is to develop top liners out of Norway that had the, this Nordic sense of melody but have spent the time to learn the language so you can actually write international hits for English spoken territories, mm. being a Norwegian. And that's been the toughest part of my job and developing right. my writers over the years. I really, I'm really glad you brought that up because Ben and I were talking about this earlier on the train and, and, um, and Christian and I have talked about it before as well. You know, the rap on early on, because I was there early on in the first days of Swedish pop with Charon and all that stuff. And even with all the success that Max had, the, the rap was always, yeah, the melodies are amazing and the tracks are great, but the production is incredible. But, you know, the, the lyrics really are just okay. A lot of them don't really make much sense. And, you know, they're not really great American does it lyrics. Have to? Yeah, it doesn't have to, exactly. Yeah, it really, it obviously held them back. Um, but what I've noticed over the past like 10 years, maybe, but especially over the past five, is the level of top liner coming out of Scandinavia in general, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark has has just like risen maybe fifty percent in quality. I mean, I think now some of the best top liners available, uh, a huge percentage of them are are Scandinavian. Um, the language thing seems to have been entirely conquered, um, and I know why. Because of you, I'm assuming. <laughs> TV and YouTube. Really? That's what Ben said too. Netflix TV and HBO and, 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 and also, uh, you know, a growing confidence. 
I mean, you know, success creates success. Right. And you can see that even though they were a bit funny, it worked. Yeah. And it worked really fucking well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you grow confidence. And yeah. I can see this particularly from Sweden where we had this role of, of, of exporting music for the last 20 years or 25, how much the confidence plays in. Because today a Swedish songwriter automatically looks at the international market as his playground or her playground. It's not like there's, there's no division, local right. or it's, it's global. Yeah. So I think it's that. And I also think, like I said to you on the train, I also think it's, you know, I was suggesting if Eric started writing Swedish lyrics to me, even though if they technically look okay, I would still be like, I'm not sure about this, because it's not your mother tongue. Right. So it's totally natural. And I think also in the beginning, there was a skepticism to the Swedish or, or, or Scandinavian top liners, because, you know, it's not their language. This cannot really be okay. Uh, but it worked. And I think so there's a bigger acceptance also from your end now that, that we actually can. You're right. not that nervous anymore. Right. <laughs> when, when <there's laughs> a, you know, I think it's a combination of those two. Yeah. Of those two. Have you guys seen the same thing here in Denmark? Are, are you on the on the as far as top liners? Has your standard risen? Do you think that? I, I it's definitely risen. I don't think we're at Swedish level yet, to be honest, in terms of top line here. Yeah. I think it's it's great with like it's more been on the artist side. Lucas Graham, of yeah, course, yeah. potentially like the fact that he's half American help probably helps. Yeah, uh, Mer, I think has done a great job uh, with her lyrics. Uh, we don't have that many. Like we had Lucas with the lid off, Lucas, who, mm -hmm. but he was half American as well, and he's living in the UK and was signed to, to Bad Boy. So again, we haven't had that many like pure top liners. So I mean, you know, if there are anybody out there, I, I think it would be like now would be a great time in Denmark for sure. Thomas Holson has of course done it as well. Again, a little bit more on the melody and production side. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I think we can we can uh, you know uh, improve for sure. Um, but I also think it, it depends, it goes a little bit back to what you were saying earlier in terms of genres and knowing the different cultures. Because I, I, I do think they have obviously amazing top line writers in Sweden and Norway as well. Having said that, there are certain songs or genres where I wouldn't necessarily write the, the lyrics with a Swede or, sure. or, or yeah. somebody from Norway, even within pop. But if it needs to be a little bit more quirky, clever, you know, maybe, I don't know, what, there's quite a few examples out there. If we're more on the, you know, EDM kind of songs, pop songs, then great, you know, yeah. it works. But there's a lot of other genres where, where I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Ben mentioned as well that maybe the EDM thing, the whole top line phenomenon, has encouraged and made, made sort of empowered people who do melody and lyrics to feel like they do not always be reliant on a producer, but to be able to do something very basic and get it out to producers all over the world. Yeah, I think it's definitely a part of the kind of top liner boom we have in Sweden yeah. because we have a lot of really good top liners. Uh, because because you you can you could write songs on a piano or a guitar and send it out and you get it recorded by by some of the big DJs. And uh, so you were depending on a producer making the making it sound right in the studio. So I think that's definitely because over the last five years, we had a, a huge increase of, of, of good top liners. Uh, ten years ago, I would have said like Surin. I would have said mm, yeah. because that's where we were then. But we were great at production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not that anymore. Mm -hmm. I feel like also I f uh, maybe it's just my sense, but it seems like it's been a, a very female-driven progression. Um, the quality of lyricists <coughs> like that. It's, it's really the females that are leading the way as top liners and lyricists um, on this. I don't know why that's the case. You um, want the answer? Can, <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> females write better lyrics. Right. That's there you how go. simple it is. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, yeah, I think so. Do you? More, um, more interesting, deeper. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Other, the other topics. The biggest part of the audience are female. Right. So oh, it's female right, writers yeah. writing for female yeah. listeners. Right, so yes. Not rocket science. Right. <laughs> um, you, you don't might not want to hear more about the truck going down the road. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. You have to move to Nashville for that. Um, which actually brings me to a question that I had thought to maybe leave till later, but I, I'll, I'll bring it up now because I talked about culture a little bit in, in the keynote. But 
how much of the success of Scandinavians in the pop music world do you think is rooted in a cultural thing? Um, how much of it is, you know, it's, it's been so consistent and so widespread that you start to wonder, obviously the question has been, is there something in the water, is there something in the way that, you know, in the heritage that brings this. Um, there seems, does seem to be a collaborative sensibility that exists in Scandinavian culture in general that I think has served it well in pop music. Certainly the production house kind of idea that all you guys have been involved with. But um, just curious as to whether you think there's more to it than that. Is there something cultural that drives this? Christian? Um, yeah, well, I think um, uh, we've done a lot of work. I think we all have in, in Japan and Korea with J-pop. Right. And, and uh, we're at least moving into China now as well. I think what we've seen out there is that Scandinavians are uh, willing to accept that another culture knows what they want. Whereas American and UK writers will come to Japan and go, that's shitty music, I'm not writing that. Right. Where, where a, a Swede or a Dane or a Norwegian will go, well, okay, let's, let's try it out, let's see what we can do. You obviously know what you want, so let's see if we can bring that to the table. Yeah. Um, and that's been a huge difference in accepting, accepting that uh, Koreans want something different than Japanese or they want from something different from P3 and writing for that market instead of coming in with your music and saying, this is what's hot right now can take it or leave it, basically. Yeah, I think um, it's pretty much what you were touching on in your keynotes in, in, in respecting and understanding mm -hmm. yeah. where you're going. And, and plus for Sweden, it's that we're the most anxious people in the world. I think that's <laughs> a big... No, but it's, um, you think I'm joking, that's a big driving factor because we, we don't want a bad vibe in the room, so we adapt. Mm -hmm. So if you say yellow, we go, yeah, yeah, yellow. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great way to export music, I can tell you that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is there a weak point in the Scandinavian business? I talked about the, you know, the myopic tendency of, of the American market, which I think is its weak point, and, and it ties in ex with exactly what you said about them going into other, why, there's a remarkably small number of Americans who've had significant success in the J-pop or K-pop world, given the size of the, of, of the country. is remarkably small, and I think it's exactly what you said, it's an inability to, adapt and unwillingness to kind of understand, and that's a very American, I think, sensibility. Um, you know, I think, to me, Germany is always a little too focused on local product. They're, that's been their Achilles heel. You know, they're big enough that they can live off that, and so they don't really look outside of it. Um, just curious, where do you think, what, is there a place, and I'll, I'll run this all the way down, where, where do the where do the Scandinavians fall short? What, what could you guys do better? What, where is your weak spot? I think there's, you know, there's probably plenty of them, uh, you know, to be honest. But, uh, but it's, uh, uh, so far the strength of Scandinavians, or at least of the Swedes, has been that any subgenre can turn up anywhere in the world and we can always turn it into pop. So, uh, you know, but it's true. But we can't create a subgenre of any kind. Right. We're, we're too anxious for that. Uh, but, but I think, you know, and as as long as as long as melody, music is melody driven, because you were touching on what's the argument. I remember that era. That's yeah. when Max Martin closed the, the studio yeah. and went for holidays for three years <laughs> because there was no melodies. Yeah. Wisely. So, but. So, so I think that as long as as long as people people are, are wants to hum along to, 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 to tunes, right? You know, we we probably now learned how to deliver that. But then there's obviously probably business weaknesses and stuff. You know, inside our, how how our structure how we structure that can be can be better, I guess. Uh, what do you think? <coughs> uh, it's. Um from doing this quite systematically in 20 years, it's uh, the business side, it's culture side, language. Mm -hmm. um, it's expensive, you know, geographically it's expensive. Uh, a lot of my writers, they should work out of Norway, but still have to travel a lot, as I say, because you have to be there. Right. So it's expensive. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit challenging to conquer the world out of Oslo or Copenhagen or because uh, you do have we have a few handicaps and, and for me 
almost 20 years ago, what we started doing was to analyze the handicaps we had and then try to eliminate them. It's a good strategy for anyone, actually. Mm. Write that one down. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think some of the things that the guys are, are touching upon as well, and, and um, I mean, right now, we are seeing a, a trend globally that's definitely very urban leaning. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we have like local versions of urban music in every country now, which is great. But if we're talking about global music, then it kind of needs to be American for it to really travel right. when we're talking like, you know, Atlanta kind of trap right, urban right. to be believable. Uh, so I think that's a challenge for a lot of Scandinavians that where it's hard to compete with that or be part of that. So I think, you know, like, like Ben is saying, as long as there's, there's a good melody in it, then it's easier for us. Um, and then I think, I mean, uh, one thing, when, especially when you go to America, but, but a lot of other countries, uh, in, in Scandinavia, we, we uh, live in societies where we trust each other quite a bit. Mm. And that's a, a huge advantage for us locally and also in a lot of scenarios. But when you go to America sometimes, you shouldn't always trust Americans. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of hustling going on. I don't know what you're on. saying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not you, Eric, of course, but, but other people. Uh, but yeah, but there's, there's, there's yeah. a lot of hustling going on. So and we're not used to always having a lawyer represent in terms of contracts and stuff like that. Yeah. So that would definitely be a thing where, where you know, that, that, that could be a downfall for a few yeah. people starting out. It's actually interesting to watch because I think clearly Americans have glean some of the, especially the production house mentality of Swedish that, that came out of the whole Swedish thing and, and the Scandinavian thing in general. And, you know, you look at something like um, Mike Karen's setup in LA, it's very Scandinavian in certain ways, but without the trust. It's like, it's like the same idea. It's like filling the studio with a bunch of guys who are going to hang out and make music together and you'll go in and run in and come up with a bridge idea for that song and you'll go over there and it's all very except that there's no trust whatsoever it's like a gang of vipers like yeah, because you, you're, you're coming out of such a more competitive society I right mean, if you look at the hockey players we are sending to 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 nhl the swedish guys are the one who makes all the great passes americans and canadians are scoring right and that's pretty much you know also reflects where you're coming from yeah uh, in sweden it's great to hit that nice pass yeah for an American, it's primary that you score. Yeah. 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 And uh, I actually came up with, I, I, I remember, I forgot, I should say, that there's actually one weakness, I think, right now, which is uh, in our structure, in Sweden at least, and that's that we're missing, we're missing uh, half young A&R people. And with half young, I mean, people, I mean, our infrastructure today looks a bit like a DJ uh, equalizer like that. <laughs> you have a bunch of old fart like me, farts like me that's been around for, for a long time. And there's a lot of young people, uh, you know, starting businesses or working for the majors. But because we were just firing people for, for 10 years in, in when we had the Pirate Bay thing happening, uh, the guys we should have recruited 15 years ago were never recruited. Mm -hmm. So so the kind of new rising stars, I'm, I'm kind of I'm happy to see Christian because you're probably half young or something. <laughs> <laughs> And we have a couple of half young guys in the bank in, 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 in Copenhagen, which is great. But in Sweden, we're missing a lot of them uh, because that it was, the music business wasn't, wasn't an option. There were no jobs. And that can be a threat mm -hmm. because the going there, meeting people, you know, it, it, take, it takes guts, it takes money. And, and to have that, you've got to be a bit of age sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think so when you're 21, you, think <laughs> that's, you actually don't. <laughs> Christian, what about you? Do you in, any insight into what you think the weak spot is or where? Well, I, th I think it comes back to the size of it. So one of our main issues, this is, this is also an independent versus a major issue, but we don't have home markets big enough to, to sustain us when we don't have things going on internationally. And it's, it takes a lot of money to start things up internationally. So um, we can build writers, sure, but, but keeping writers on the long haul where the, where the big money is made is tough for us because we can't compete with US or UK uh, publishing houses. We can't compete on advances. Um, we can compete on creative work, but if you're a writer who spent six years with local publishers mm -hmm. and someone from the UK or the US college and say, I have a million dollars 
and I'll do all the things that your Danish publisher does anyway, but I know right. all the people better, so I'll do it way better. They sign that deal and figure out that they're not getting any of the help. They have some of the network, and that might work out. But that that part is tricky for us. That part of funding and and kind of being in for the long haul, because we are all in for the long haul. But but that competition is it, we have a weak point in size basically. But yeah. you know, s sorry, but ah, oh, fucking microphone. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's been too long since I used it. Uh, you're absolutely right, but it's also something we we shouldn't even try to compete with, because they will come back. Mm. Some of them. Sure. Others will thrive, and and uh, you know, and it's it's kind of pointless. And uh, I, just to comment on that, because one of the things that I see in Sweden right now, we had a, we had a, we had a period of time where where big advances was a was a thing, you know. Mm. And there was a period of time, early 2000s and a bit in, where also people were paying huge advances for. for. But today, uh, uh, w what I would say for a young aspiring writer, it's actually more important to get into the community. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning again, the, the, the social hangout, the studios and, and all that. They're not asking for an advance even, when, when, because they, they have realized that the money will be made out of people giving them the right support and connecting them with the right people. But then eventually, you know, you succeed, mm. and next thing you know, there's an American. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I partly agree with you, but uh, and we don't, we uh, almost never pay out advances as a policy because we're happy to fund travel and and actually spend money on developing someone. But it's hard for a writer that's struggling and and is is getting creative work from. From a publisher, maybe on a song by song deal, you're starting out a relationship, and then someone comes along with a check that uh, that's two years pay um, because they're starting to hit on something. But they should grab that. Mm, well, maybe. life is long; you learn. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, but it's that's a that's a tough little little place in kind of a, in early. Um, I mean, I, 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 this has happened obviously a number of times, probably to Kai as well, when you, you know, and Sir, and they, they come. But I mean, there's numbers of, you, you can try to fix it. I, 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 I know that in, in some cases I've, I've done like co-publishing deals with people and they want to pick it up so that you still, you know, mm. it kind of depends on what relation the relation with the writer is. And, but then some times when people pile money in front of you, you, you go blind and, mm. you know, go. Mm. There's other ones, there's new ones. Sure. Yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm curious about that. So in terms of deal structures, the kind of deals that are done here, um, are, are no advanced deals relatively common in, in most of these territories? Are you looking at, I mean, is, is co-publishing the norm or, sub, or is a, a full publishing deal the norm? What, what it, what's kind of, I mean, I know obviously everyone changes their deal structure based on who they're trying to sign, but but what not, not cover publishing in the in the American form right no, okay no no it's it's, okay. it's it's straight deals and I'm taking the word now sorry yeah. but, but <laughs> no but I think I would say for, on our behalf and then uh, I think it's uh, people would want a, a place to be so the studio is important they need we're talking about somebody who is signing their first deal right now and, and, and we put in a travel advance so that they can go when they need to go uh, that's about that, but then also have to remember that you know we come with a track record, and you know to be Swedish again, I come with 100 number one records across the world, mm -hmm. so they also know that they're signing to somebody who actually right, sure. probably might know what he or she is doing, and that's the value in it as well. Right. Because uh, and they kind of uh, people are quite sensible, I, I would say, about business wise. They know that okay, because we just renegotiated with a writer we had worked with for a year, and she became really successful. She was much tougher now, I can tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all our fault. Right. That's kind of the game. Yeah. You know, yeah. we helped uh, uh, right. putting her in a, into a good place, and now she's in a good place, and she wants that place to be even better. Yeah. That's how it goes. Is that typical in Norway as well? Those kind of uh, like a, a no advance, full publishing kind of setup? Is that what? Yeah. <coughs> it's, as you say, it's a lot about track record, because that's how we get new talent in. And it's uh, one of the sales pitches, and, and it's true, is that we work with maybe 20 writers. If you sign directly to Sony TV in London or LA, they have 10,000 writers. Mm -hmm. You can get so much more attention from, we are now a quite big team. I, 
I've been waterfall music for, for 20 something years, but now we started Arctic Rights Management, where we've got several publishers to come together to build a bigger Norwegian publishing company. And we now have a good team. We are like eight people. We can really, we can book travels. We can apply for grant money, which is, I guess, quite Norwegian. We can, <laughs> as, uh, as Arctic Rights, we have a track record that makes it very likely when we apply for money we'll get it because we have proved in the past right. that we can make a change a difference and and succeed so so there's a whole template of things that that we can use as sales pitches that Sony TV in London can never do towards the Norwegian talents mm. but when we develop them and get to a certain level and the and we actually shoot ourselves in the foot because we always introduce them to international managers because we need right. more. Right. We introduce them to UK or US lawyers yeah. uh, that's, that we are introducing them to and then they're backfiring on us trying to renegotiate sure. the deals. And, but that's okay. Cause that's business. part of the yeah. business. Yeah. So, and sometimes they get to a level where we can't compete and where the big, big money comes in, like Ina Rolson, Carolina Lind right. and so on. Mm. Uh, but they tend to come back uh, at some point. Yep. They miss what they were coming from. Right. Mm. Soren, you must have run into these kind of issues, especially working in, in London and LA on an extended basis, where the deals must have been kind of <coughs> mind-boggling in terms of right. what, yeah, compared to what you do. Uh, was it? I assume it was a big difference from you from what you were used to doing in Copenhagen. Yeah, definitely. There's a huge difference. I mean, just purely the deal structure is so different. Just the legal system is so different. Like America versus Scandinavia, of course. Uh, you know, you the the amount of pages pages right. you get in deal in America compared to a Scandinavian deal is there's a huge difference. You definitely need a lawyer or two lawyers or three lawyers to check it just to make sure. And there's so many potential pitfalls. I think where. You know, you can you can end up in a deal for quite a while if you don't recoup within a certain period, or you don't you don't um, reach your minimum of percentages of songs that you need to to have a share on of major releases or stuff like that. And I think we've we've gone away from that in Scandinavia. Uh, so there's no like minimum commitment necessarily, I see. which is a, a, a classic thing, obviously in the UK and the US. Um, so it's it's I, f I feel like the deals are more more fair. Mm -hmm. I, I would say in in Scandinavia, um, they're a little bit more transparent as well, mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I think it, it it's a little bit more straightforward. And people are, again, to a certain extent, maybe a little bit more reasonable sometimes right. here, just because of society and the welfare system and everything. So again, the the pot of money. You know, it, it, it doesn't really compare necessarily if you have 20 grand in America, you can sign quite a few people if they come from nothing, right? But here it's more like, well, you know, it, it's an advance, it's a loan. If, it, if I'm just getting the money, it sounds like a very expensive loan for me. What right. can you actually offer even people that haven't proved themselves yet? Mm. Which is, you know, that's just a, a huge difference in, in terms of doing deals abroad, I would say. Which is nice. I mean, we always say to, to the writers, well, we can pay an advance, but it is a loan. Like, Let's let's sit down. Let's look at the structure. Let's look at okay. Well, you probably need this much for travel budget. We got a great grant system in Denmark as well, actually, which can help out a lot. It it's it's a huge advantage for the publisher and the writer, because because it's not the writer that needs to recoup it and right. so forth. So it's much more of a actual conversation, I would say, with the songwriters than at least what I hear yeah. from my American colleagues. Mm. And just have to comment on the granting system. We don't yeah. have any in Sweden. Uh, we are actually granted less in total for music export than Iceland. Wow. <laughs> but still we're okay. <laughs> the grant thing actually is fascinating to me because it, it obviously just doesn't exist in America at all. I mean, even the thought of it is preposterous. <laughs> right? they, they, they won't even fund a symphony, much less fund you know, someone in pop music. Um, and yet when I was in Norway, it came up again and again. I mean, it, was, it was a very important part of the business. Um, which is, I, th I think, really interesting. Do you think, uh, I, I assume that you guys feel positively about that. Do you think it changes the nature of your business at all? 
Um, do, you, do you find yourself focusing on doing things because it, you think how this is going to affect your grant money, or is it just something that's just an overall positive that, that allows you to, like you said, send writers around the world? Well, I think Saren touches on a good point, which is you can, you can help use that money to invest in writers where you wouldn't necessarily be able to invest in all of your writers that way as, a, as an independent. Um, the other side of it is, I know Cern's done this and we do this as well, you can think on a bigger scale. So one of the big problems for us as an independent publisher with no funding from a major is that paying for a, a large scale camp is a lot of money that won't come back for a year or two or three or four years because the cuts, even if they come right away, it's still going to take a while for the money to come into our bank account. Um, and funding from, from the Danish government in this case helps us do those kinds of things. Um, and we can think on a larger scale in terms of doing camps outside of Denmark or flying people in uh, that would be too expensive to do on the scale that we were able to do it because um, it does help. Right, it compensates for that size issue that you yeah. brought up earlier. Yeah, it really yeah, does. It's, just, um, uh, it's the counterweight. Yeah. But it can also be counterproductive, I think. And this is o almost like a question to Kai because I used to work with quite a few uh, Norwegian writers slash artists. And I know that for, there's a touring system in, in, in Norway where you get, get a lot of funding. And this kind of, they were happy. That was that. Mm. Right, right. I write my song, I, you know, you were a writer, artist. I write my song, I have my success. I do my 20 gigs in Norway. Mm. I make a good living. Because you, 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 have, you have this, so, so it kind of, I'm not saying it's necessarily like that, but it, it can kind of, um, you know, tune down your motivations and ambitions mm. in a worst case scenario. Yeah. Plus that also, what we're in when we're talking about pop music, you know, it's sometimes looked upon as culture. It, it's kind of, you know, in America, it's not a culture. It's, no. not, it's fucking business. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And we're competing with that. You know, so it's I'm I'm not sure that 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 and and Sweden is kind of the proof because we've had never no support. Hmm. We you know we 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 have a stand at the Spot Festival, I guess maybe is Music Export Sweden here. Nope. 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 You see, <laughs> they couldn't afford. They couldn't afford to go. But, but that's what we have, and we always have the smallest one at Medem, or you know, that's that. Listen, thank you guys so much. I think you have all had a good look at probably really, really why the Scandinavian um, pop phenomenon has extended twenty years, and it's just because there's a lot of really smart aggressive business people leading the way and you've had four of them right here so i i hope you guys have learned something i uh, hope you enjoyed the keynote thanks so much for coming in i think that the attention now turns to eurovision i believe uh, so i will i will leave you guys and thank you very much <laughs>